My name is Che. My pronouns are she and her. I'm coming to you from Cherokee and Muscogee land, also land that was stewarded by enslaved Africans, also known as Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, what to say about me? I've been practicing generative, with generative somatics since 2013. Uh, I'm a community organizer. I'm an abolitionist. I'm a movement security practitioner. Um, I'm a politicized somatics practitioner. I'm a Taurus, for those who care to know. I don't know the rest of my chart, so please don't ask. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of incredible teachers in my life. I've gotten the privilege of being a part of a lot of great groups, like the Audre Lorde Project, like the Racial Justice Action Center, and currently Vision Change Win, um, where I get to teach safety and security practices to left movement groups. So, hello. Um, I want to just start by talking a little bit uh, about what is politicized somatics. Some of you might have heard this term floating around the internet or the ethers, and you're curious, and you're like, what is it? Um, some of you might have heard the term many times, and you're like, I still don't know what it is. So I'm going to do my best to describe politicized somatics. Um, the way I like to think about it is, you know, we are all shaped by our families, our communities, the world we're living in, the political stratosphere that we're in, um, it, both the trauma and the resilience that we experience at each kind of layer of our landscape really shapes who we are, how we move through the world. And as we're doing our change work, right, our badass left movement, politicized healing and organizing work, um, we can sometimes act in ways that don't totally align with our values. Um, you know, sometimes we might get short or impatient with loved ones. I know y'all don't know anything about that for the other people, you know. Um, you know, sometimes we can be closed when we really want to be open. Um, sometimes we can be appeasing in hard moments where it might actually be a more effective move to come with a centered, principled fight. And so in order for us to change the world effectively, um, to really make the left movement um, vision of our world come true, and also to heal ourselves and to maintain our beloved communities, we gotta have some skills, right? Some new skills. So somatics really helps us with that. Um, it helps us to understand how we've been shaped through these different landscapes. And then most importantly, through practice, we get to start changing our automatic responses to pressure. Um, we get to have more choices. And really that is what somatics is all about. It's about having that understanding of self. And then you don't change overnight, right? It's not magic, um, but you do over time get to be more choiceful under pressure and really get to pull out all the fabulous tools that you have in your tool belt and say, this is how I wanna move, right? We get to move in a way that's choiceful, that's in alignment with our vision and our values. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about generative somatics. Some of you probably know a thing or two. Um, you know, generative somatics, we practice uh, politicized somatics. Um, but we're not the only ones. There are lots of really awesome, really dope BIPOC and Black-led groups who are also practicing and teaching politicized somatics. Um, BOLD is a great one that I've been a part of, the Embodiment Institute, so many great orgs. Um, I really encourage you to check them out and to really kind of build your, your research around politicized somatics. Um, you know, generative somatics has been in a bit of a transition period for the past three years. Uh, maybe you have also. Maybe we've been moving together, changing together. Um, but really, you know, the past three years, this organization has really been intentionally reshaping. Um, we're building more kind of out of the you know, outside of the box ways of learning and practicing politicized somatics daily practice groups, specialized courses, really adapting to an online and Zoom way of teaching, as I'm sure a lot of you have. Um, we've been practicing more transparency, more dignity, more shared power, and more collaboration. 
So we thought it would be kind of cute to just bring everybody together and just share a little bit about what we've been up to, what we've learned over the past three years, um, and really most importantly, kind of how we've navigated these times of crisis and collapse and the places where we've seen beauty and possibility inside of our lineage and inside of the politicized somatics methodology, which we find pretty awesome. So you're gonna hear from some really incredible practitioners who've been doing awesome work. Um, there'll be some Q&A at the end. So I know I see there's some questions in here already about the playlist. These are great questions, um, priorities, I like that. Uh, feel free to throw more questions into this Q&A. Um, we are seeing them, some of them we're responding to quickly, GS staff is responding to, and some of them we might actually kick to some of our um, practitioners, our panelists today. So keep them coming. All right, um, I'm gonna kick it now to Erica, who's just gonna ground us with a centering practice before we get started. Thank you, Che. Thanks y'all, really glad to see so many people here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move into our core practice. One of our core practices is our centering practice. And we do this to become more present with what is more open to what is inside of us and more connected with ourselves. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to get a little bit of grounding before we head into our topic tonight. Um, you can choose to do this seated, standing, or even lying down. Um, so really be self-responsive here. Choose a position that feels best for your body. Um, again, it could be seated, standing, or lying down. Um, for the purposes of self-responsivity, I'm going to go ahead and stay seated. Yeah. Um, all right. So go ahead and start to drop into yourself. Yeah, just really feeling for your body here. Yeah, landing in you. Um, and keeping our eyes open as we move into this practice, yeah. So it's like we can be present with ourselves and present with all that's around us. And so we'll start by just bringing our intention to our sensations. Noticing in yourself, like, do you feel any place where there might be movement in your body? It could be flowing or streaming. Um, it could even be stillness or quiet. And then also noticing here if there's any place where you feel pressure in your body. It could be tension or um, it could even be slackness. Yeah, so just noticing those things in your body. And then even here, like noticing other places in you where you feel temperature differences, maybe places where you feel more warm or more cool. So just really noticing that. Yeah, and then noticing your narratives here too what things are coming up for you in this moment. Yeah, maybe your thoughts are running and you can just gently notice them without judging or trying to push them away. Just making space for all of you. Yeah, your sensations, your feelings, your thoughts, these narratives. And then let's go ahead and start to drop into center. Yeah, we'll get organized on purpose, on purpose. So really feeling for, yeah, like your center. And center is that place two inches below the belly button. Yeah, so you could put a hand there if that's useful. And then also, yeah, having that hand there, just really being with yourself. Dropping your attention, your energy, your focus down into your center. Yeah, so really fusing your breath to be in center here. And when we're standing, this is actually our center of gravity. Yeah, it's also our center of purpose. And so we'll center in four dimensions today, length, width, depth, and commitment. So you can allow your hands to drop back down to your sides, finding some relaxed length. So we'll center in length first. So really feeling your feet on the ground. Yeah, just really noticing how your foot feels as it makes contact with the floor beneath you. And allowing yourself to really settle down here. Like, can you drop down into gravity? Can you drop down into earth? Allowing your weight to drop down, not having to hold yourself up so much, but it's like resting into the gravity here. And while also resting down, allowing yourself to lengthen up towards the sky. So it's like we're really pulling along our spine, along our long bones of like legs and 
thigh muscles. Yeah, so just really finding that long center line in you. Extending towards the sky, extending down towards ground. And seeing like if you can create more space in along your neck. Yeah, so like bringing your shoulders up and pulling them back around into the back of the shoulder pockets there. So just really giving your neck, your shoulders, your chin some more space here on your length. And here in this dimension of length, we really equate this to like the dimension of inherent dignity. This space where like really truly, like inherently without having to do anything, we are worthy. Yeah, this like real energy of like, we don't have to produce anything. We don't have to be anything. We just get to be worthy of care, love, protection, safety, belonging. So allowing yourself to try on that dignity. Yeah, noticing like, what does it feel to try on dignity in your body? And then noticing the dignity of my fellow panelists. Yeah, really relaxing here into your length. And then we'll go ahead and center into width. And so really finding balance from side to side. You could sway from side to side in your chair or while standing. You can really like bring your arms out and feel yourself in your expanded width. And then allowing your arms to come back down to your sides. Yeah, so here this dimension of width, it's like the places, the edges where you begin and end. Yeah, so it could be like the sides of your arms, the sides of your legs. Maybe you can feel the clothes on the sides of your legs or the sides of your calves. And then we get to be really choiceful here in width. Yeah, so here in width is like this place where we get to let ourselves out and let others in. It's this dimension of belonging yeah, that we can rest into connectivity, that we don't have to hold ourselves so tightly. Yeah, that we don't have to be in self-reliance. We can actually allow ourselves to come out more across our edges and be in interdependence with all life. Yeah, all life on earth. And so noticing again where you begin and end, and maybe it's like softening your front vision and allowing your peripheral vision to be more prominent here and noticing what's at your sides. So softening your gaze and allowing yourself to be with what's at your sides. So centering and with here, finding balance from side to side. And then we're gonna center in depth. So here in depth, really feeling for, seeing if you can notice like the clothes on your lower back. Can you notice what that feels like? Or maybe can you notice the clothes on the back of your legs? And then from there, really allowing yourself to inhabit your body. So using your breath to feel for your internal landscape. Yeah, so maybe you can feel the beating of your heart or the pump of your lungs. Or maybe even feel your rib cage pushing in and out as you take deep breaths here into your belly. So that's our internal landscape. And then feeling for what's at the front of us. Yeah, feeling for our front selves. So maybe it's like feeling for the front of your face, the tip of your nose or your jaw, and really allowing your jaw to hang here. Allowing your tongue to release from the roof of the mouth and the jaw to just hang from the hinge. And then with that, softening the front of your chest, seeing if you can invite like one to 2% more softness in the front of your chest. Can you become more permeable in the front of you, allowing more of you out and more of your environment in? Yeah, so this is the dimension of depth. It's like what's behind us are the things that we've moved through. It could be your individual or collective lineage, the place where maybe we connect with, make choiceful connections with our ancestors. Yeah, allowing what, what, what already came before to pass through the present very choicefully. And then also like heading towards somewhere. Yeah, like our front bodies are like on a path and we're headed somewhere. And so we can organize knowing that like we are a shape headed towards the future. 
And then lastly, we'll, we'll um, center in our declaration, center in what we care about. So truly, it's like from this place, allowing your body to answer this question, what are you longing for? Yeah, seeing if your body can surface some answers for you and like less your brain, less your mind, less your head. And like, can you drop down in you and allow the body to answer? Like, who do you most care about? Who do you most care about? And what do you most care about? Yeah, just allowing that to really shape you. And if you have a declaration, you can go ahead and state that to yourself and allow that to shape you here. And then generally with our centering practice, we always end with a mood check. Yeah, so just checking in here on like, how are you feeling in this moment? And allowing what you say to actually line up with how you're feeling. Yeah, really practicing a moment of congruence here, of alignment. Yeah, oftentimes people will ask us like, how are you? Oh, I'm great, I'm fine. And it's like really, truly, like maybe we're not. Maybe we're experiencing grief or sorrow or joy or love or connection or reverence. Yeah, so really using this opportunity to like check in with yourself of like, how am I in this moment? Really, truly, how am I? Yeah, our emotions start off as sensations. And so can you sense how you're doing in this moment? Yeah, all right. Thank you for centering with us. Thank you, Erica. Oh, I wish we were together in the same room. Yeah, we're going to make it work virtually. Um, I get the privilege and honor of lightly leading this conversation and sort of um, moving with y'all brilliant, beautiful people together. Um, I don't know if y'all know, all y'all, not the people on the screen, but you're in for a bit of a treat. Um, these folks have been doing a lot of really cool politicized somatics work in really different parts of the country, in different communities. Um, and I'm just so excited that we have this group of folks together. So I want to just do some short introductions um, so that folks can hear a little bit about you all. Um, Eliana, we'll start with you first, just like your name, your pronouns your location, um, role in GS, and then I want to know what is bringing you aliveness right now? What's making you feel alive right now? Start with you, Ileana. Thanks, Jay, and thanks, Erica, for centering us. Um, I'm Eliana. I use they and she pronouns. I'm in Durham, North Carolina on Yesawin, including the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation. I am a GS practitioner and group facilitator. Um, I started with GS nine years ago and was doing other political and healing work before that. And what's bringing me aliveness, I can't really stop talking about this experience of um, going out to my garden and cutting these lilies that I'd been waiting for years to bloom because the deer found the buds to be so delicious that I never got to see them bloom. Um, and then they finally bloomed and I had a friend who had just given birth and another friend's birthday and I went and cut them to make bouquets and had this moment of like, but these flowers and then I came out the next day and they were like there were like 17 more that had bloomed from that um and that just made me feel so much yeah aliveness and belief in the abundance of land and bodies so, that's that thank you Eliana ah oh, beautiful um B would you mind introducing yourself for them? So sure. Yeah. Thanks, Eliana. Thanks, Che. Thanks, Erica, for centering. Um, yeah, I'm B, Steph. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm here in Seattle, Washington, on the lands of the Coast Salish. 
and Duwamish people. Um, yeah, I'm a GS practitioner, facilitator, all of those things. And um, I've been inside of this methodology since 2010, when I first stepped on the map for the first time. Um, yeah, I think the thing that is bringing me the most alive right now, it's like the tie. Um, but I think the one that my body is, is calling me to name right now is um, my practice of Muay Thai, which is my martial art that I practice. And um, it's a martial art that is fierce and it has a lot of lineage to it. And um, it's just a time where I get to be with other people who are committed to this same path of practice, the same lineage and be like really fucking badass and really in my power. And um, yeah, it's like, it's, it's raw aliveness right there. Hi y'all, I'm Erica Lila. I use she, her pronouns. I am currently living in East Oakland, Ohlone land in California. And um, I am a gender somatics practitioner. I see folks one-on-one -on -one and also do some coaching and body work. I also teach some courses and work with organizations who are trying to increase their capacity. Um, I am uh, super excited to be on this with you all. I think one of the things that I love most about this lineage is just the ways in which it really invites us um, to have more, to be more, to live in our abundance, um, and to really like be in more connectivity with each other. Um, I am also a mama of a three-year-old, um, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. So much goodness some lilies, some Muay Thai, some mothering of a three-year-old. I love the, the diversity of aliveness happening here. Um, okay, so we are here to talk about beauty and possibility in times of crisis. Um, I, you know, I want to just first start by saying that we have been in it, y'all, all of us, everyone here, y'all participants folks who are listening right it has been three years of trash just absolute garbage um i say all the time that the world is on fire but right now it quite literally is on fire right and and then figuratively there's just been so much political shift in the past three years and i just want to recognize that it's been rough for a lot of us right like many of us have experienced just like deep personal, intimate and community relationships to the legislation that's coming down against trans folks in many states right now. Many of us are really intimately connected to the Supreme Court's recent decision to basically make it really difficult for unions to stop labor, right? That's a very real and visceral and embodied way that many of us are experiencing just the political landscape shifting. And then of course, we have a presidential election coming up and there's just so much tumultuous white nationalist, white supremacist and fascist violence that we're seeing inside of our communities, especially black communities, especially folks who are doing direct action work or civil disobedience. Super important for us to just lift up all the ways that inside of that, we are surviving, right? We are thriving, we are pushing back against fascism, we're doing important healing work. Um, and some, you know, we're looking a little fly too, which, you know, is a little, is difficult in these times. So I just, especially now. Yes. Um, and so in the midst of all of that, right? Um, there's also all of this great politicized somatic work happening somehow, some way. Um, and I just wanna hear like just some basic, basic, how are you seeing this methodology used in ways that are inspiring you, right? Like just on the real, like what are, what's the cool shit that you're seeing in the world that makes you feel inspired? Um, Erica, would you mind if we started with you? Sure, yeah. I mean, there's definitely been ways in which right like there's been such cool 
things happening over the past few years with uh, this lineage. I think about like um, the work that folks are doing to really unearth um, more indigenous roots of these practices um, to really land us in like, yeah, what is the lineage? Like who all is involved in um, the work that we are in um, and being making sure that like we're naming folks, right? Like naming communities, naming um, people who have really uh, deeply offered to this lineage of somatics. Um, and like, I, I feel so inspired by that. Um, I think about like the ways in which even um, as black people, right? There's, there's indigenous practices that we have been in um, that I see similarities in some of the somatics work that we do. Um, so that's been really, really cool. Um, another thing that I've been seeing is just like the level of like creativity, um, folks really being in with each other to bring somatics to like just like far places like here we are doing somatics like offering this um on zoom um whereas like you know previous to the pandemic um a lot of that was like very limited so access has really grown um over the past few years and folks that maybe weren't able to get access to this lineage um have been able to um which is really really cool um yeah anyone else want to jump in here yeah i can jump in yeah, I mean, I think just to add on to that, Erica, it's like, yeah, like we get to do somatics in a fundamentally different way now than we did prior to the pandemic. And there's something about somatics that is always asking us to meet the conditions that we're in head on and really like be in deep connection with what's real and what's happening live. And, you know, I just really see like the move to online as a piece of that, but like, you know, we all know like our lives are not the same as they were three years ago. Our lives are not the same as they were last week either, but especially in these like big, huge historical force moments, that's so true. So it's like, oh, a different type of somatics is probably necessary. And I feel like that's what we're growing into in this moment is the somatics that can like be creative as you're naming Erica, the somatics that like, um, I was typing in our little panelist thread earlier. It's like a, it's like a supple type of rigor, you know, or it's like, okay. we can like really like bring ourselves that we can like bring ourselves with a certain amount of like pliability that has boundaries, but is like movable and shapeable and like can feel really deeply inside of these conditions. So I think that's really what I want to name and I mean it's just like there's just so many people inside of our GS community who are doing just that I mean including the three of us but it's like uh we've really we've really risen to that occasion and been like okay here's a proliferation of online somatics to meet meet this moment at this time I love that supple be that's mm -hmm. such a great way to describe it and you know Erica I really appreciate what you shared about just the opportunities of being online virtual. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like we have so much to owe the disability justice movement mm -hmm. and disability justice leaders who been done on Zoom. They've been on Zoom, right? They've been doing virtual gatherings um, pre-pandemic. And I think you know, one thing that makes me feel like permeable or supple about our methodology right now is that we're getting to learn a lot from this community that has been creating many different ways for people to plug into movement for decades. And in many ways, like the rest of us are getting the, the fruits, right? We're getting to be like, oh, here's how to adapt to a world in which many folks can't go outside or leave their homes for all sorts of reasons. Here's how to contribute to movement. Here's how to heal together and not sacrifice connection. Um, I get really excited about that kind of stuff because I'm like, we're not leaving any of us behind. I think that's been such a cool thing to witness is that permeability and our ability to really shape shift around this question of like, how do we keep all of us in? So cool, mm. so cool. Ah, Ileana, what kind of cool stuff are you seeing? Um, yeah, I think similarly, just the, the adaptation and this moment, right, of like opening that happened in 2020. And I think 
on this thread in addition to seeing more access um, through online offers and also just within GS really looking at how do we talk about practice in ways that aren't like here's the practice and then here's an alternative way to do it but like here are many ways that we practice and those are all dignified um that yeah so that lineage of disability justice even within the org feels really potent in this time or in in the work and then also i would say um for folks who it's been accessible for doing this work outside because of the pandemic like was i always wanted imagined doing this work like more in connection to land and you know in trainings we'd be like out in the parking lot in downtown oakland doing joe and i was like this is really fucking cool and also like i want to do this in the forest with y'all and um i started to see clients at the eno river here um in a couple years ago started doing that and just sharing that place and feeling that sense of being held by something bigger than any of our bodies um and always the like synchronistic moments that like a great blue heron comes and lands right in front of us as we're centering or whatever it is just feeling that that reminder of like we are practicing in our bodies and we're practicing in the bodies of the lands we're on too mm -hmm. uh, that feels like a really sweet invitation of this time yeah thank you so much for that reframe um I love that you brought up Joe. It's my personal favorite for folks who aren't familiar. Um, Joe is a practice that um, we've adopted that comes out of a Japanese martial art called Aikido. Um, Aikido is just a really cool martial art that really moves and shifts with energy um, and was practiced by a lot of like regular folk in Japan, um, folks, farmers, people on the hillside, people who were not trained as warriors formally. Um, and for me, like Joe is how I got really hooked into somatics. When I first started, I was a little bit like, I don't know about this, y'all. <laughs> like, you know, I had some internalized ableism that I needed to work through. And also I just, um, you know, I was an organizer. I was burnt out. I was tired. I was working in New York with queer and trans folks of color. And all my homies were like, Che, you're burnt out. We don't know how to fix that because we're also burnt out, but we need you to go to this course and they're going to, they're going to work it out for you. And it just, it opened me in a way that I wasn't expecting. Um, and I, I kind of want to like zoom out one layer from where we just shared and talk a little bit about organizers and change makers um, and folks who might not necessarily be inside of politicized healing work yet. Um, so my question for y'all is like, how can politicized somatics support change makers and organizers in being effective, right? Like, how does this work make our movements um, more able to win? Um, anyone can kick this off. Yeah, I can enter here. I think like I have two two stories that I'll that I'll share. And one is very personal. You know, like I I found this work in 2010 as a young organizer myself. And um I was really active in anti-war organizing and student movements. And um yeah, I really found generative somatics at a time when a lot of the organizing I was doing on a national scale and a local scale we were in a lot of conflict. We were in conflict that was like gender-based conflict. There was all of these accountability processes that were happening. There was like so much that was really tearing apart our capacity to be effective and to really like stay inside of our vision because there was so much stuff that was swirling around inside of our interpersonal ways of being um, with each other. And I'll just say like for myself, I found somatics at a time where I was like, damn, like I'm gonna quit movement because like wow. these people, cause we're, we're hypocrites. Uh, it's like, we can't embody these values. And then I found somatics and I was like, oh dang, okay. Like here's a place where I can like bring my whole political self 
And I can also get healing because like that therapy thing, it wasn't working for me because it wasn't speaking to like where I was working and what was happening for my people who I was organizing with. And so I found somatics and, you know, I had a long journey of healing y'all to really be able to be like, I'm an organizer again, because so much had been hurt inside of me. And so much had been really like, uh, I, like it wasn't safe for me and I didn't feel dignified for me to really like claim that experience. But it's like somatics helped me actually heal all of that stuff. So I could be like, I'm actually staying in movement. I'm actually going to keep doing this work. I'm going to keep contributing to this world that I want to be in, not just as a healer, but actually as an organizer too. Um, so that's really one thing I want to share. Um, actually, I think I'll leave it at that because I, I feel like that personal experience like is still why I'm here and really like what I want to keep contributing for more and more of us because like it's so easy to fall out of movement for these reasons. And it's like we need all of us to be all in and it's like somatics really offers us that path and that way of, of keeping each other close and like continuing to heal while we keep each other close. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing, B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's like what you're saying about your own experience in movement and like something I feel like we talk a lot about as practitioners is this or this just this recognition of a lot of people enter movement seeking healing right like in the conditions of experiencing trauma or state violence or internalized oppression right. it's like I'm fucking mad and I want to do something about it and like movement doesn't always take care of that anger and so I think that like somatics is one of many tools and ways that we get to infuse movement with more of that value and practice of um, personal and collective transformation as part of a political project. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like specifically, you know, we're talking about this in this theme of beauty and possibility in times of crisis and collapse. And I think, um, I think one, one of the pieces of somatics I've been really moved by is, is embodied work around pleasure and really building off of the work of Audre Lorde, Adrian Marie Brown, um, you know, long and wide lineages of healing justice and pleasure-based organizing. Um, and that I think that's such a huge offer to change makers and organizers. You know, we, we have, a lot of us have more practice or more, yeah, more reps in of like, uh, how to confront the stuff that's really hard and how to get in, like get into that messy accountability process, get into that um, conflict, get into that campaign, whatever that is. And it's like, yes. And how do we keep resourcing ourselves, particularly in a time of so much collective trauma to really um, center pleasure in the body and that I've just seen in my own, in myself and in my practice, how that like from my own lineage and, and inheritance of like this Ashkenazi Jewish commitment to suffering, I'm like, I know how to do that really fucking well. Mm -hmm. And I remember GS teachers really pushing me around my commitment and being like, where are you in that? Like, where is your pleasure and joy and liberation? And how can you keep bringing that to your organizing, to your work? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's that, it's that thing of like, if we can't, Somatics, I think of as like a prefigurative practice where we get to embody and imagine the world that we're fighting for and start to like feel and scale that out into our collectives. Mm. Mm. Eliana, what you shared reminds me of, um, yeah, I'm going to tell a quick story, quick one. Um, yeah, I work with a group in Atlanta called Women on the Rise, um, abolitionist, women of color, um, formerly incarcerated led group. And we have this long standing campaign to close this jail here. And I remember when we started the campaign and we were doing all of these kind of like groups just to get a sense of like, what's the hook? Like when we go to like, table outside of Walmart like what's the thing that we can say that's really going to get people 
you know. And so we tried all these different things on. Um, as abolitionists, we can get wordy. So we had a lot of words, <laughs> you know, it's carceral and it's da da da. And like all these folks were sitting in this room listening to us give up, and they were like, yeah, I would keep walking. <laughs> I would not <laughs> want to stop and talk to y'all. Um, even though many of them were like, we hate the jail, we understand why it needs to close, like we really strongly want to move that money into social services. And we were just like, well, if you agree with that, then why wouldn't you stop to talk to us? And they were like, because I get enough of that. Like I have enough of the what I don't want to see messaging in my life. Yeah. And so we flipped the script and we started actually just talking about the money that goes into the jail. We we're like, what if you had $50 million? What would you do with that? And really leading from that place of pleasure, but also from visioning is something that I find a lot of abolitionists can struggle with sometimes, right? What happens when all the jails close? What happens when all the prisons close? What happens when we actually defund the police? What do we want instead? And how do we build that? And not only was that like so juicy and really got people to literally lean in and eventually became the messaging that we use to get folks to actually join into the organization. But it led to some really great policy changes. Um, it led to some really great defunding of different parts of the Atlanta criminal justice system because folks were able to lead from vision, from pleasure and from joy and really say, here's where that money needs to go, right? Here's what we need to see here. So I just really love that you brought up this idea of pleasure, really, and like what we can lean into as well as what we can dismantle, Eliana. So important. Um, Erica, I don't want to leave you out of the picture. And I know you also have worked with some really dope groups. So um, again, like same question, just like what, what does this work do for, for leaders, for organizers, for change makers? Yeah, I mean, I love this question because it's really like, we're all interested in like creating change and it's like, how do we do, how do we stay sustainable in the change in the midst of the change? And um, yeah, like working with organizations who are really feeling the pressure to, to land some of these um, campaigns, right. To really get some of this work done, to really like shift things in like a real sense. Mm -hmm. um, and like the burnout, the exhaustion that comes from that, um, and it's like, are we tuning into our bodies, right? And like, um, there may not be opportunities to actually slow down because of the conditions, right? Because of what we're up to. Um, sometimes it's possible to slow down and like resource and then other times it's not. Um, but it's like, even in the midst of all of that, like, right, some of the, one of the things that I've been working with organizations on is like, how do we intentionally cultivate resilience? How do we be in a practice of like intentionally feeling um, joy, hope, awe and connection like what are we doing that is actually allowing us to be in deeper connectivity with each other and with ourselves mm -hmm. um and so yeah like really allowing folks to deeply deeply explore what resilience feels like in their body um and not just like the resilience of like oh you went through something like hard and you're so strong like how resilient but like truly this like embodied feeling of resilience that um leaves us feeling more connected than disconnected um, that leaves us feeling like more generative than like um, not. And um, yeah, I found that like resilience practices have been really great for organizations. And um, yeah, like even similarly working with an abolitionist organization, like really sinking into this idea of like when we are exhausted and still need to make several more pushes within a campaign, how are we asking for support from each other? Like, how are we allying with each other? Um, like, are we able to make requests that actually get our needs met? Um, and for many of us, that's not the case, right? Many of us have been trained out of asking for what we need, or even just like tuning out what our body is indicating to us or is signaling to us. Um, and so like, there's like, right, that our somatic alliance practice has been so key in allowing teams to be in um, actual discussion about like, hey, like support and allyship looks like this to me. And it's very specific. Like, I want you here doing this with your hand here. Right. It's like from an embodied experience, like how might we um, lean into care with each other mm -hmm. uh, from an embodied place? How might we be able to notice when we're feeling held and when we have felt dropped 
And can we work up the courage and use our centering practice to like land some requests that allow us to feel held individually and collectively? Um, and that somatic alliance practice has been so crucial for organizations that are um, really up against a lot of pressure, right? Because oftentimes what happens is a uh, right, the fabric of our connections start to fray under pressure. And um, our somatic alliance practice really gives us an opportunity to like pause and be in a, a deep exploration of like, what feels like support to me? And can I ask that of my comrades? Can I ask that from the people at my sides? Um, and really trying to train in something different. Yeah, like instead of training in self-reliance, it's like, can we train in interdependence? Yes, interdependence. <laughs> um okay so this conversation about resilience is making me think about like you know kind of like remixes like a little like you know we take in this practice but we're gonna make it um work for our folks or for my body or for your body right um so I guess I'm curious oh and this is my like plug to all of you listening please ask questions right like we really want to talk with you. So please throw questions into that Q&A. Um, we're going to come to them in just a little bit. So don't don't be shy. OK. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious about like how are y'all creatively evolving this politicized somat somatics lineage? Like, are there places where you're remixing stuff? Are there places where you've seen like adaptations that have been really dope or inspiring? Like, how are you making this work as things are shifting, as bodies are changing, all that good stuff? Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, yeah, the remix is essential, right? It's like as conditions change, we too need to change mm -hmm. and shift. Um, and so I'm always thinking about like our two-step practice that really is like, how do we recenter in, in the face of change, in the face of transition? And one of the things that I've really had to um, adapt um, were just even like our practices around um, like our declaration practice, right? Of like really being in like a deeper exploration of like what people care for or what people are longing for. And it's like that in the pandemic felt really frightening to a lot of folks. Yeah, to like be in the midst of a pandemic and also be trying to deeply long for, deeply vision for the future. Um, and it's like, yeah, can we, in the midst of like deep fear or deep terror, uh, still have and build a, the capacity to long for something? Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed that in the pandemic, I really had to actually slow a lot of my practices down for our clients and organizations and groups that we are working with. Um, and that looked like spending more time actually being in the body and allowing folks to feel like a sense of like hunger, like a sense of like desire. And like, um, I really love what Eliana was talking about earlier about like pleasure, because it's truly like, right, like in our bodies, we can source pleasure and we can identify where pleasure lives. Um, and it's like, if we can land back in that pleasure or land back in hunger, land back in thirst, it allows us to make um, much clearer, bolder statements about what we're wanting for in our, in our future um, than if we're landing in like fear or terror. Um, and so like, I really... Um, have appreciated the opportunity to like slow things down. I found that like the pace I was in prior to all of this was just so fast. Like I wanted to like get clients from like one session to 10 sessions with all of the skills. Yeah. And um, I'm really learning that like, actually like we can slow it down. Yeah. And like our bodies can learn and absorb at such a, at a much slower pace than if we're like hurtling through certain practices. Yeah. Um, and so that's been important for me. Um, as I set up what I'm offering to a client, right? Like I may say like, hey, instead of 10 sessions, I actually think this is going to be more like 20 to 25 yeah. and really having to like land in like some solid honesty around that um, and not being so quick to want to offer transformation within like the first five sessions. Um, it's like actually like this is a long-term game and um, yeah, like let's slow it down. Mm. So that's one of the things for me that I've been remixing. Slow, slow, slow. I like it. Mm. What about y'all? Other places where you're seeing some good remixing or things that you're experimenting with? I just had this moment of like 
listening to you, Erica, where I remembered like early on in the pandemic, I was like, I need some like auto regulation time. I'm going to watch a nature documentary and had been doing some transcription for um, a friend's book and didn't realize my like uh, video player was on a slower speed. Mm. And I watched this whole <laughs> documentary about whales. Like it took like three hours to finish it. But it's that it's like, oh, what else becomes possible when we like really sit in the slowness of um of time? And yeah, I think for me, the slowing down has also I yeah, I feel that. And the slowing down has also meant um, I'm gonna be a broken record on this, the pleasure in play is like less spent, like often, um, you know, you reference the like 10 sessions. So like some of us as practitioners will use this kind of 10 session curriculum. And there's technically one session around resilience, though, of course, we all do it different and it's always woven, but I I feel like I've really remixed to be like, let's put that in every session. Let's play together. Let's remember that pleasure and play is just as opening as trauma right like we can go into the trauma and that can be good deep work and like this this assessment that I've had that I think a lot of us shared was like when COVID hit being like there might not actually be enough capacity or resource in the body to do some of this deeper trauma work that we might have done last year with our clients like let's spend a little more time doing like relationship building playing together um and like let that let that open into what needs to transform. Um, and then I think even zooming out farther to in terms of like remixing, like what is somatics? What do we consider a somatic practice? Um, and I've had both like from my practitioner and supervisor had a lot of encouragement where they're like, the work you're doing on the land, that's somatics the work you're doing, like throwing these like lavish parties at your house, that's somatics, like getting people in their bodies together. Um, feel like to me, I'm like, that's what we want. We want to be in our bodies. We want to feel safe with each other. We want to feel connected to the land, right? Like those are all, it's like boiling down. What are the principles of decolonization of abolition? What does that look like in the body and in our communities? Um, and so for me, the remix has been remembering to slow down, remembering to connect with the land and remembering to play. I love it. Okay, the questions are rolling in. People have mm -hmm. lots of questions. Um, I wanna start, I'm gonna combine a couple of questions together that are a bit related. Um, and Ileana, I'd love to start with you around this question. So, there's a few folks who are asking different questions about, you know, the reality of being present in our bodies is like a little terrifying, right? <laughs> it's just, you know, like, let's be real, right? Yes. We spend a lot of energy, time, and money disassociating, right? Mm -hmm. And that is so smart. And it is so great that we have the ability to disassociate and to cope. And so with that kind of backdrop, there's two kinds of questions that I'm seeing a lot in our Q&A. Um, one kind that's about sort of like, how do you explain somatics to folks who are disabled or folks who might feel like they are quote unquote, like at war within their bodies, right? The second community inside of this that I'm seeing a lot of questions about is survivors, right? People who, may maybe in crisis mode right and kind of like up in sort of um their rapid response or their trauma response and so for folks who might be like yo being in my body is terrifying being in my body brings up all kinds of trauma being in my body highlights chronic pain right i don't like it um how would you explain somatics? And I think really the question inside of this that I'm not putting words to people's mouths, but the question I'm hearing in this is like, for the sake of what? Like why I feel? I'm gonna start with Ileana and then kick it to any of y'all who wanna answer. Yeah, such a good question. Um, 
I mean, well, I'll be transparent here. I kind of made the decision. I'm going to share more of like my own experience because I live in a really small town and I'm not trying to talk about my clients. Um, and what I've, yeah, what I've seen and experienced in my own relationship to chronic illness and um, yeah, being in a body that is often not pleasurable to be in or where there, yeah, there is that tension. It's like, it's, it's what you were, I think it was Erica was saying, reminding us of like, it's about the choice or no, it was you, Che, at the beginning. Like, it's about finding that moment of agency of like, okay, this is, this is an automatic way that I am in relationship to my body. And I might, I might choose that and I might not. So like, for me, a lot of the times I have to be in override mode. I'm like, I'm like, if I fell into the level of fatigue, I feel in my body every day, I would not ever do anything. <laughs> right? Like there is this, there is some, and, and that it feels different when I'm like, all right, like I don't really want to get out of bed. And like, there's, I can feel my commitment and there's some choice I'm going to make here. And, and I'm going to like move towards that maybe in a smaller way or a different way, depending on the day. Um, so I think the for sake of what is the commitment and then figuring like tuning in to be able to have enough of a map of your body to say like, what feels possible for me in my body and knowing like there is no right, there's no like, this is what embodiment looks like, right? It's like for you, what is embodiment today? Um, and the for sake of what is, is based on you is based on like what your, your personal, your political commitments and then on a collective level, I think the for sake of what is that of like why feel when it's painful to feel is like the not feeling is what creates so much violence in the world, right? Like in terms of people who have power, I'm sort of shifting here. Um, the inability to feel impact, the inability to have empathy, right, is part of how systems of oppression get perpetuated is that we aren't connected to um, the impact we're having on people's lives. So. I think why feel is that, uh, yeah, we need it. We need it for our own healing and we need it for our movements and we need it for like, yeah, this big, beautiful world that we're fighting for to live in, to be able to taste fruit, to be able to feel the sensation of someone touching your skin. Like there's there's simple ways to, um, to, to, tap, to tap into that. And sometimes it might be like, my big toe feels okay today. And that's real too. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Sometimes it's the big toe. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. One of our one of our teachers says um, it's unfuckable. LHM. Shout out to LHM. And I think like that's one of the core things that I just like am really regrounding into all the time with the folks who I work with is like hey, like you just get to show up however you're going to show up to this, knowing that what we're doing together, it's unfuck upable. What you're feeling, it's unfuck upable. And so like for me, it's like a piece of this like supple rigor that is so important in the way that we are reimagining somatics right now is just that. And then like another piece that feels really important to me from another lineage that I that I study in um, we talk about doing C work, like the letter C. Um, mm -hmm. It's like not A work, like the letter C, like C minus on the grade from school, you know? It's like just good enough. Like if I can show up and like get rid of this perfection thing, then like what's available to me? And I've had so many folks, y'all, just be like, hey, the one thing that kept me in this group, the one thing that kept me in this practice was that permission to just do C minus work. Like you said, B, you said at the beginning of this, I just had to show up and that's what kept me in big mm -hmm. toe and all like you're saying, Eliana. So I think it's like, yeah, if we really get away from this idea of embodiment being this, this thing that is like out here for us, it's like, what if embodiment is actually available to us right now because embodiment just means that we're able to take new actions under uh, under the same old types of pressures. So it's like in each moment, like what becomes our like rubric for that? And it's like, 
oh, okay, yeah, like maybe I can feel like my whole big toe rather than just like the tip of my big toe. And that actually lets me know that I'm safe enough to do that. Or it's like, you know what, like today I noticed that I was feeling a lot of fatigue and I chose to rest a minute longer, yes. And then that gave me enough energy to, to move and decide that I'm going to take that next step or I'm going to like go to that meeting that's important to me or I'm gonna like show up to my my group that I'm a part of, whatever it is. Um, so it's like med- like changing the, the ruler that we measure with, I think is super, super important because oftentimes like that ruler that we're measuring with, it's not our ruler. It's an inherited ruler that we've inherited from power. We've inherited it from white supremacy. We've inherited it from racial capital. And so it's like, what does somatics actually let us have is like our own ruler that we're measuring our lives and our capacity and each other's capacity by. So, I mean, I think that's really what's up. And like, I don't know, just on the why feel tip. I think similarly to what Eliana is naming, like if we don't feel, we'll never have the, it's like it's like in the name of not feeling, that's how all this violence and harm gets really perpetuated. But it's also like, um, there's something there about like the, there's like pleasure in rigor. There's like pleasure in like choosing to feel even though it's hard. And then like being like, oh, dang, like I did that. Or like we did that together that I think is something that is like so beautiful because it's like we start out, you know, and it's like we might not feel like we have that much capacity. And it's like that that rigor or like that pleasure itself, that is something that is practicable. So it's like the more we do it, the more we'll be able to do it. And that's really what somatic says. So um, it's like we've been we've inherited some sets of things, and we get to practice other sets of things too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think too. Like right, inheriting some practices. It's like for some of us, right? We've inherited um, generational trauma. Yeah, and there's like a way in which like our bodies are contracting tightening, tensing on like the muscular tissue level um, that like prevent us from actually being able to feel ourselves or that contribute to chronic pain. Um, And it's like, if we can move closer to like these new practices, it's like, can we relax enough in ourselves that our nervous system can calm down um, and like loosen some tension, loosen some contraction. Um, Yeah, I I love that. And then, Another thing to add to your question, Che, I think, I mean, I think the acute crisis setting is like, you know, really challenging. I actually worked in um, an emergency room here in Oakland for many years and was able to incorporate a lot of this um, embodiment practices and work into the things that I was doing with patients and doctors and nurses. And, and yeah, truly like you don't have to, right. Use some of the language that we use, right. That can make it feel inaccessible. Like we don't have to use the word embodiment or like, we don't have to use the words, um, trauma or healing. Um, right. We can simply ask a doctor who's maybe, uh, just lost a patient, just died. He, right. We can like ask a doctor, like, Hey, like, can you pause with me? And like, I'd like to do something with you. Um, which is something that I used to do on on the regular, um, asking them to pause and like, let's just feel. And like, if you were to like, you know, allow your jaw to relax a little bit more, um, what feelings are present? What feelings are more available to you? Um, And then same with patients too, just really allowing folks to get some um, basic level of like understanding of body um, sensation, how that contributes to emotions. um, And that like held um, unhealed, unhealed emotions can lead to, to sickness. Um, mm-hmm. and so just really wanting to like be attentive to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could stay here all night with you all. Um, I don't know if participant y'all, we could be here for another couple hours. <laughs> They're all like, yes. Um, we won't do that because we believe in disability justice. And that means not having seven hour long panels. <laughs> modeling uh, there's so many great questions that we're not going to get to um, but I just want to lift up that so many folks are very excited and they're like 
okay, great, I'm sold. Where, where do I sign up? How do I how do I get in? Right. Um, to the folks who are like, how do I get in? Like, what is the next thing? Um, I just want to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. Um, check us out on social media. We have some courses that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so just keep kind of checking in with us and sign up for a course or a practice as they're available. Um, I want to just close. I know I can't believe we're, we're almost done. I don't know how that happened. I want to close with like some, some hope, you know, some like looking towards future. Um, in a couple words or a sentence, I'd love to hear from y'all like, um, what hope do you have for the future growth of politicized generative somatics for our lineage? You dream big. Um, a couple words or a sentence. B, would you mind kicking us off? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, like building easeful and fierce power for millions and millions of people in this world um, and having that be infectious. Hmm. One of the things I'm really hoping for is like a deeper, wider capacity to love and be loved. Just really like um, filling into like our ability to like deeply care for one another and also receive it. It's like if we can get really good at loving and being loved um, I think we will have a lot, um, yeah, a lot under our belts. Mm. That's making me, I'm feeling into like, hope is hard for me on the rail. It's hard. It's the practice every day and um, commitments. Um, Erica talked about them in the centering practice of like what's your declaration I'm just thinking about like both my personal and political commitments right now and to what you're saying of like one of my commitments is I'm a commitment to loving and being loved with the softness of my blubber and integrity of my dorsal fin and I want that I want that animal seal body in myself and in my loved ones and then my movement commitment is um, to transgressive beauty and pleasure through embodied connections with land and lineage and that is what I'm hoping for and believing in and rooting for in all of you. Mm. Thank you, y'all. I really appreciate your brilliance. I feel like this is like a trailer to a great movie. And you're like, wait, I want to see the movie. Uh, there's so much more that we could get into. So just gratitude to y'all for your brilliance tonight. Um, I want to add a hope to the mix as I kind of transition away from questions to you all, to questions to you all, the people who are watching. Um, I want for this work to be sustainable. I want it to feel effortless. I want people to be able to be able to do this work in a way that feels held by many, right? And I want it to be something that is never just falling on one person because so much in our movement falls on one person, even though we don't want it to, right? Um, and so I just want to transition into talking a little bit about how GS stays GS. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I contribute to GS in this way and in other ways is because I get really inspired by this work like Eliana, hope is a hard thing for me to tap into. And right now for folks who are, you know, in Atlanta or working near or around Atlanta, we are pushing very hard to stop a training facility from being built in our city for the cops. Um, the training facility is going to cost buku dollars and all that money could be going into services for our people. Um, in addition to that, they're cutting down so many trees um, and then just creating a really um, scary environment for neighbors. Um, and so in my city right now, there's so much pressure and there's so much need for folks to move very quickly. Um, and because of that, we often end up relying on the same like five or six people to do all the things, right? 
And that's not fair and that's not right. Um, and I think that one thing that GS, that politicized somatics can offer is that pause that Erica was talking about, um, is also that kind of pull in that B was talking about earlier in organizing work, the staying in, where we get to be a little bit more intentional with how we organize. So GS, you know, we've been really blessed um, because we've been pretty financially well supported through the pandemic. And it's because of donors, like individual folks like y'all, um, who really just kept us afloat, kept us able to pay practitioners, um, kept us able to offer programs. And we're at the point now where we need to build a new donor base. Um, you know, I, I hate talking about money, but also we live in a world where so much money goes to cops and really expensive training facilities and so little money goes into community healing. Um, and so it's really important for us to just like name that, um, and then do what we can to really support the work that's actually changing our communities and keeping us well. Um, so I think there's like a hundred something y'all. How many of y'all? 150, there's 150 y'all. I'm not, I don't do math. One of someone over there, you y'all do math. But I think that we have a goal um, of raising $100,000 from individual folks. Now, could we get to that goal tonight? We could, we could. But if everyone here donated 35 bucks, um, we would be a little over half. We'd be more than half. I don't know. A math person, please help me out. Uh, we'd be closer than we are now. How about that? Um, for some of y'all, you're like, that's way more money than I spend on anything. Che, what are you talking about? Cool. A dollar is great. Five dollars is great. Um, for some of you, 35 bucks is nothing. You might spend that, um, you know, on subscription services in a month. Um, if that's you, right? If it's not you, don't listen. This is not for you right now, but if that's you, if 35 bucks is no thing. Um, we're also asking that you donate to our partners. Um, we have two partners that we work heavily with. APEN is one of them. Women on the Rise is another one. Um, I believe the links to donate to both of those orgs in the chat right now. So that's my request um, to give 35 bucks tonight if you can, um, less if you cannot to spread the word if that's what's available to you and to donate 35 to us and 35 to one of our partners if that's available to you. Um, I'm really grateful, whatever you can offer us, um, you know, it allows for us to keep doing this work in a sustainable way. Ah, there we go, screen share. A QR code, we're very fancy. Um, and yeah, I just, I wanna really appreciate that there are so many questions about how to get plugged into courses. So for folks who have asked in the Q&A, um, stay tuned, this is the trailer. This is like the dun dun dun. Um, more will be coming and specifically places for folks to get introduced to somatic work. So if that's you, if you have, if your palate has been wet, if you're like, okay, I have an appetite now for this thing, how do I get into it? Um, we'll tell you. But first, we would love some support from y'all. Um, we're about to come to a close, y'all. I want to just take a pause as you're like doing your phone with the QR code thing. I can never like quite get the, the picture to do the thing. So take your time. Um, but as you're doing that, or maybe you're checking out our website or our social media, um, or you're or you're asking more questions, great. Um, I do want to just give some gratitude, and I know we can't see your faces, but could you just like yell or like do a little do some energy at these amazing panelists, um, show some gratitude and love for them, B, Eliana, and Erica, um, just really brilliant really offered some really, um, I think, juicy tidbits and just did a really great job of telling us how this pandemic has really shifted and reshaped politicized somatics. So thank you, y'all, so much. And thank you, beautiful people, for being here tonight. Um,